Good morning. I hope you're all doing well today. As you can tell, I'm not Todd. Todd is uh, with his family in Florida on a well-deserved vacation. But if you're visiting with us today, you're an honored guest. I hope you, uh, we're glad to have you, and I hope you stick around for a little bit that we can get to know you a little bit before you leave, uh, especially our friends from Fort Hill today. If, uh, if you haven't met these young ladies and gentlemen up front, I encourage you to do so. They're some of the best young people you can meet. They're great people, and I'm excited to have them with us here today. Uh, I don't have any references about Victoria's Secret, but I hope I can keep you interested anyways. But in all honesty, you know, some of my favorite memories growing up with my family is just the times we were bent over laughing to a point where we can't breathe. And, you know, the church, the church is a family. And uh, it's moments like that this morning that, like, we can really look back on and cherish and just uh, and really enjoy. So, no, that's, that's all honesty. So let's, uh, let's pray before we get into things. Dear God, we want to thank you for uh, all the little things you give us. Thank you for the beautiful sun outside and the beautiful day. We ask that you open our hearts to whatever you want to do in us, Lord, that you would speak to us today, regardless of my failures and my uh, capabilities, that you would let us know what your will is and that we would continue to work for your kingdom in this world. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you today, go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 5. Mark 5. Some of you have heard me talk about Mark before. If you ask me what my favorite book in the Bible is, I'd probably tell you Mark. Um, Mark is kind of like a highlight reel uh, of Jesus' life. It's the big moments. It's, it's, it's pointed. It's, it's quick. It, you know, Mark uses the word immediately 42 times in his quick 16 chapters, if that gives you any kind of indication of the book of Mark. It's just bam, 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 one item after another. And it's because of things like that that so many people dump Mark for more detailed Gospels like Luke or, or John. And those are fantastic Gospels, like, don't get me wrong. But I think we sometimes blow by Mark, and I don't want to do that, because he's got a lot of good things to notice, too. He's, you see, Mark writes as kind of an artist. He tells these small little stories that are all interconnected, that are subtle, that work together. You see, uh, for example, in the first few chapters of Mark, you see Jesus talking and calling his first few disciples outside the Sea of Galilee. And then the next story, he's t- teaching a large crowd outside the Sea of Galilee. And the next story, he, there's such a large crowd outside the Sea of Galilee that he's almost pushed back into the water. And then the next story, he's out in a boat preaching in the Sea of Galilee because the crowd is so big. You see, there's these subtle little things he points out to show you things. And our story today is kind of like that as well. It falls in this uh, series where Jesus is using his power, uh, and people are having to decide who Jesus is because of it. Before this story... He, call, he shows his power over the natural world by calming the seas and calming a storm. In this story today, you see his power over the spiritual world and healing a demon-possessed man. And then the story after this, he heals a sick woman and then shows his power over death and resurrecting a small girl. And so in all these miracles, people are forced to decide, you know, who is this Jesus person? Who is he? And so with that context in mind, let's go ahead and read Mark chapter 5, starting in verse 1. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the, to- uh, the boat, a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. The man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. Now let's stop a moment and take a look at this man and his situation a little bit more because it's so easy to just read through the Bible and you're just reading through it and you blaze through without even really noticing kind of what they're saying. But if you look at this man, I don't think any of us have ever seen something quite this scary in our lives, to be completely honest with you. Imagine you're coming to shore, you're getting out of a boat, and you see this big, unshaven, naked man in a cemetery, cut and bleeding with pieces of shackles and chains hanging from his wrist and his ankles. I mean, I don't know about you, but if I'm one of the disciples, I'm going to have to change my pants later because that's a very scary scene. I mean, this guy is in, as an individual, the worst situation imaginable. He's in a terrible situation. In fact, he doesn't even look like a man. If you, if you heard that description off in the, off in the distance and hearing kind of the crying out that they said he was doing, and you couldn't quite see him, in my mind, I would my first thought is an animal. I'm not going to think it's a human being. I'm going to think that's an animal out there. But he, um, 
that's kind of what's happened to him. His humanity has almost been stripped from him. In fact, the word subdue, we're talking about the men trying to subdue him, is used a lot more often in the Greek with animals than it never is with human. This guy has just been reduced from his humanity into this sad state that he's living in. And it's not only his physical state that's in shambles, but he's also been cut off from his community. See, by the Old Testament law, anyone who came into contact with the dead was unclean for seven days. And as an unclean unclean person in the Jewish law, you're not allowed in public places, a lot of public places. You're not allowed to worship in the temple and many other things. It's this huge social restriction that's put upon you that kind of cast out um, a lot of interaction. Furthermore, in Numbers 19, it says that those who failed to be purified from the pollution of the tombs must be cut off from Israel completely. And this guy was living in there. There's no way he's ever getting purified from these tombs because that's where he's staying. This guy is in complete isolation and complete loneliness. And it kind of makes me think of, you know, where did this person come from before we read about him in the story? You know, do they have a family? Well, we see later in the story that Jesus tells him to go talk to his family. So he has a family. Whether that's a wife and kids or whether that's his own parents and siblings, we don't really know. But this guy came from a place where people loved him. You know, he had friends. He had a life. And can you just imagine what it was like for those people to see him starting down this road, whatever that may be, to wind up at this point where you can barely even tell he's human over animal. It's sad. He has no more relationships, no more friends, no more comfort, no more love. He's just in this sad, lonely place with only his demons to keep him company. And even without the talk of the Old Testament laws and the clean versus unclean discussion, the saddest part here may be that this man, even as he lives and even as he walks, is rejected and consigned to the land of the dead. And I think, I think Mark makes the point of mentioning the tombs a handful of times here. So we see that while this guy is up and walking around, you know, he might as well be a dead man walking. And I don't think we can say enough about the sheer desolation of this man that he's living in, if you want to call it living. You know, he has no control in his life because of the demons inside of him. He's constantly in pain from the demons using himself to cut his own body. He's been completely cut off from anyone who has ever loved him and his only interaction with human beings being them coming to restrain him and shackle him down like an animal. That's the life this man is living in. And to be honest, the the picture that I think Mark painting is here is this is a monster. This is, you know, a monster you would read about in a book or see in a movie. That's what this, this... this description is, you know, unshaven, naked man in a cemetery possessed by demons. Kind of sounds like a a monster to me. But then we keep reading, starting again in uh, verse 6. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Swear to God that you won't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send him out of the man or the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the evil spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Now, I find this kind of interesting. On one hand, you have this man who's so big and strong that he's breaking chains left and right, and he's possessed and empowered by a legion of demons. Now, a legion uh, is a military term, right? So today, and like we talk about military uh, groups, we have like a company, a battalion, a squadron. A legion was the largest known unit in the Roman army. And mind you, the Roman army was the largest army that had ever been seen on the face of the earth by that point. So we're talking the largest military group and the largest army possible. And they, they average that out to about 6,000 men was what the thought was. And this is not, you know, I think there's, there's something there to be seen and that these weren't like civilian demons. These were demons that were soldiers. These were demons on a mission, right? Right? Excuse me. So you got this one man who's big and strong and empowered by demons. And on the other hand, you have this man who specifically, physically, there's not really that much you can mention about him. And you see him squaring up. Who does conventional wisdom tell you is going to win that fight? I mean, 
I don't know about you, but if I'm coming in not knowing what's going on, I see a big, strong man that looks like he's possessed by demons, and then like an average-looking guy, I'm putting my money on the big guy, right? But then you realize that the average-looking guy is the incarnate God, <laughs> and then there's not even a struggle. See, on the movies, in the movies and the books, when you see two people from two opposite sides coming together, there's going to be a showdown. There's going to be a struggle. And most of the time, they fight out until one person is left standing, right? I'm a huge John Wayne fan. Huge John Wayne fan. When me and Delaney got married and we moved in together, she knew I was a John Wayne fan. I don't think she realized I had like two shelves of movies. And for our uh, youth group, if we don't know who John Wayne is, we can have a class about it or something. It's very important. <laughs> but in these movies, John Wayne is always ends up with the bad guy, fighting it out. Either they're fighting fist fighting or they're having a shootout. It always comes down to this big struggle right? But in this story, that's not exactly what we have. We see, this is what happens. Jesus gets out of the boat, and the, man, and the monster falls to his knees in defeat. Jesus gets out of the boat, the monster falls to his knees in defeat. It's kind of anticlimactic, if I can't say so myself. But that's the point, you see. The one true God, against the one true God, 6,000 soldier demons don't even have a chance. They don't even try to fight. They've already lost. And their only option is to beg. You see, um, being unclean spirits, forcing a man to live in an unclean cemetery, it's only natural that they want to go into the most unclean thing that they could find in the Jewish law, and that would be the pigs. And Jesus allows them to enter the pigs. And in the same way they used the man to cut himself and mutilate himself, thus marring the image of God that he carried, they now turn to destroy another piece of God's creation, in the killing of the pigs. But the point here is that Jesus, his power is shown in a whole legion of demons are brought to their knees and cast out of a human being that so many men had tried so hard to contain and to fix. They had shackled him. They had discarded him. They had rejected him. They had done everything they could. But when it came to Jesus, all it took was his words. And that's a God worthy of celebrating and that's a God worthy of worship. Continuing in verse 14. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and the countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave the region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you, and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis area how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. Now this is a weird story, and this is a crazy story, and it's a scary story in so many different ways. But let me reread one last time what I think might be the weirdest sentence in this entire story in verse yeah just listen when they came to jesus they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there dressed and in his right mind and they were afraid i see dave payton over here dressed and in his right mind i'm not exactly afraid you know i saw john mcafee up here earlier dressed and in his right mind and it didn't scare me everybody look at your neighbor Hopefully they're dressed. <laughs> they're most likely in their right mind. Anybody scared? I almost expected one of y'all to hold your hands up. I'm glad you didn't. But that's the point. You see, the, the man that they were so afraid of for so long, they're not afraid of him anymore. They're afraid of the power of Jesus that had transformed him and given him his life back. See, at the beginning of the story, this man was naked, but now he's clothed. He was possessed and now he's freed. He was shackled in a cemetery, and now he's kneeling at the feet of Jesus. And I believe that is the message and the story for all of us here today. Because whether we acknowledge it or we don't, we're all, in some shape or way, the monster from the beginning of the story. Now, some of us have an easier time accepting that than others, but while we aren't possessed by a legion of demon, and we're not living naked in a cemetery, we have all looked at ourselves at one point in time and thought, what in the world happened to me? This isn't who I am. 
And I'm not trying to guilt anybody. If you know me at all, you know I don't like guilt. That's not the way I work. But everybody in this world looks down at some point in their life and sees the blood and the mangled cuts and feels the rejection of the world around them and looks and is reminded by the worst times in their life by the pieces of shackle and chain hanging from their wrists and from their ankles. We all know that feeling. We've all been there. The beautiful thing about it is that there's a God in heaven who looks down and through all of that and where we see a monster, he sees his precious son or daughter. And it's because of that that he sent his one true son to die on a cross so that, like the man in the story, we may be freed from our chains and we may be freed from our demons and kneel at the feet of God. The only question that remains is what will you do with that transforming power of Jesus? Will you fear that what the future may hold and cast him out of your life like the townspeople in the story did? Or will you, like the freed man, find renewal and restoration in your life by the power of Jesus? If you want that freedom from sin, if you want that freedom from your demons, from your scars, from your chains, please come forward and let's baptize you in the blood of Jesus as we stand and sing.